Today we look at a very curious word called goodness. Verse 22 in chapter 5 of Galatians, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. One of the words that's tucked away in there is simply called goodness. It's a very curious word. In the English, we feel that we are probably very familiar with goodness, know exactly what it means. It's a very common word to us. But there is a depth in the Greek language in which it was originally written, this Bible of ours, that brings a whole other level of illumination. This word goodness only appears in the Bible four times. Only four times does this particular word goodness appear in our Greek New Testament. But perhaps more interesting than that, this word for goodness does not appear at all in the secular Greek. It is another one of these curious words that we invented, well, we didn't invent, but was created to communicate something about God. And there was literally not a word in the secular language of the day adequate to describe this characteristic of God. Now, there's another word that some of you have heard of called agape or agape, the agape love of God. There are multiple words in the Greek language for love. The word agape or agape did not exist. They, they literally created it to describe the unconditional love of God because outside of the unconditional love of God, man doesn't know unconditional love. Amen? I mean, I know that's, but it's true. I mean, we first love him because he loved, first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. We have unconditional love to give only because we have received unconditional love. We cannot give away what we do not have. And so they literally, in the secular Greek, did not have an adequate word to describe. And, and so this word agape, agape, love was, was established. There was not a word to describe the goodness of God found in Galatians 5.22. And so they literally created this word. It's a 19th word. Word is 18. Um, the word for goodness is agathosone. 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 And um, it's up here. It means uprightness of heart, life, goodness, virtue, and beneficence. Now, some of those are not words that we use a lot today. And part of the issue with studying this word is because it only appears four times. Because it only appears four times in the Greek text. There's not a lot of framework with which to define it. And because it doesn't exist in the secular Greek, we don't have a basis of comparison. So one of the ways we're going to look at the distinctions of this word is by looking at what it is not so that we will know what remains is what it is. Now, you and I might think that we have a tendency to know what goodness is. The world that we live in today, the English language that we have, it defines goodness. But this word is unique. There is a sure in the Bible in Mark chapter 10, verse 18. It's not going to pop up here, but we're just going to listen for a moment. Where Jesus acting with a young man and he says to him why do you call me good there is none good except God there is none good except God you see this particular type of goodness that is described here it is a noun it is a thing it is a characteristic it is literally something that we possess but we cannot possess it of and of ourselves. This word, agathosone, that has been created for goodness is a characteristic of God that only belongs to God. It is something that the world does not have. And the only way that you and I possess this particular type of goodness is that it comes from God. Jesus was very clear. There is not one good except God. He was referring to this type of goodness. You see, when you look at the word for good there in Mark 10, 18, it is 
the root word agathe, which is number 18. This word agathosene, that we're that root word good. They put a ness on the end of agathene and created goodness. So this is the characteristic. I know, again, I told you a little bit of a word nerd. It's, but, but I believe it's essential for us to know what we're working with today. We are working with a characteristic, a goodness that only comes from God and is only attributed to God until we begin to walk in His Spirit. When we are redeemed, the Spirit of God dwells in us, the character and the nature of God. When we are obedient, surrendered, and submitted, that character and that nature should start to live in us and through us. So the goodness of God that only God has then becomes demonstrated in our lives. It is a characteristic, a quality, it is a noun. It only appears four times, it is very unique. One of the places that it, attend, it, it shows up is in 2 Thessalonians 1.11. And this is going to shed some light for us on what this word means. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 says, Therefore, that our God would count you worthy of His calling, this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. So now we see there of his goodness. It's the New King James. It's an English translation. I will go ahead and let you know in the original Greek text, the word his does not appear. It is absent. The word his is simply something that the translators added to try to give what they thought was their understanding of the text what was said. The original language literally reads, fulfill the good pleasure of goodness. Now, as I continue in my word nerdness for a moment, continue to be a word nerd this morning, I think that you're going to see, I think we could make a really good case that in this case, goodness could be capitalized. You're going to hear a few things in the text today that you've maybe never heard before. And I think that's fun. It's fun to dig into God's word and discover subtle distinctions of God's character and nature that, that, that we want to believe but maybe don't understand. And then we find out they're actually there in the text. You see, I believe that in this case, goodness could be capitalized. It could actually be a name of God. God has so many names. And one of his names is goodness. You see, and, and if you thought I'd been word nerdy before, it's really fixing to get, look at somebody and say extra word nerd right now. Like super word nerd right now, okay? All right. The word good pleasure is in the accusative case. Now, don't worry about remembering accusative case. That simply means that good pleasure is the object of the verb fulfill, which we probably could have figured out even without knowing it was accusative, but it's more fun to say accusative because it sounds really cool and it sounds like we're doing something important. So the accusative tense says that the good pleasure is the object to fulfill. So what is trying to be fulfilled? The good pleasure. Now, it gets more interesting when we look at of goodness because of goodness is in the possessive case which means that we have to ask the question whom does it belong to because it is in the genitive case it is a possessive word meaning it belongs to someone which leads us to ask the question in the original text who does it belong to so it says fulfill fulfill what the good pleasure of whom of goodness goodness is one who owns this good pleasure. You, you see now why we could capitalize goodness? You see now why we could call goodness a name of God? It, it's such a characteristic of who He is that it can be used to describe Him. We could even communicate. I mean, we have no problem saying He's our Redeemer. Why? Because He redeems us. We have no problem with saying he is the great I am. Why? Because he is. Or I, he am, right? He am? And yeah, I, right, that's good English, I know. Uh, so we could say he is goodness. Why? Because he is goodness. You see, there are reasons that we sing songs like good, good father. And sometimes we think it's just because they sound good. 
it's a good sounding song but the reality of the matter is the scripture shows us even in the original language that literally goodness is a fundamental characteristic of who he is now it becomes very important for a couple of reasons first of all we live in a world where not everybody's convinced that God is good and you will even encounter some people who will challenge your faith who will challenge your belief that God is good they will say well how come he did this or how come he did that the discussion even came up last night at the six as, as we were talking in the student groups about why how what if somebody you know, why did God do this why did God do that God is fundamentally good and as you'll see in a moment it shapes who we perceive him to be now there are two other Greek words just when you thought I was done being a word nerd there are two other Greek words that we're gonna throw at you today that are very closely associated with goodness the first one is erite erite and the second word is dunamis now, a couple who already know what dunamis is are already starting to get excited but you gotta wait till we get through erite and then we'll get to dunamis okay erite means virtue it is literally translated, it should be up on the overhead, Erete translates as virtue four times in praise once. It is a feeling, thought, or action that is virtuous. It is defined as virtue, moral goodness, moral excellence, modesty, and purity. Erete, it's translated as virtue. The thing is, sometimes the word virtue is translated as goodness. And sometimes the word goodness is translated as virtue. They're that closely related, but there are subtle distinctions. Our translators would not do well to interchange the words because erite is a different word than agatholsone in the original language, which means there is a distinction. But they're so closely related. We see in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, these words. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That can literally be translated, if there is any goodness, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Erite. It's also shown in 2 Peter chapter 1. But there is a second word for virtue. If you look up the definition of goodness, many of your dictionaries, even your concordances, will tell you it's virtue. The other word for virtue is dunamis. Dunamis will be on the overhead. It translates as power, mighty work, strength, miracle, virtue. Strength, power, abundance, moral or physical ability this word is also translated as virtue what could also be construed as goodness now this takes on particular significance when we begin to look at some of the scriptural context there's a story that many of us are familiar with it's, it's described in mark chapter 5 it's also found in luke chapter 8 but in mark chapter 5 we find a story of a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years she had been to all the specialists all of the medical whiz kids she had spent all of her money trying to find a solution it could not find it but by faith this unclean woman pressed through a throng of people implication is that very likely she at some point had to get on her hands and knees and crawl through the dirt and pass their feet to reach out and simply touch the hem of Jesus' garment Jesus in the crowd standing looking over the midst lots of noise lots of people the people were literally pressed in upon him the moment that she touched his garment he speaks a very interesting response in Mark chapter 5 verse 30 he says in Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him turned around in the crowd and said who touched my clothes familiar story it's in Mark chapter 5 verse 30 in the New King James but it's very interesting when we look at this verse now in the King James 
We're going to look at it in the King James. It's the exact same verse, but it says, turned in the crowd and who said, touch my clothes because virtue had gone out of him. The next scripture down should be the King James. There it is. Virtue had gone out of him. You see, this word virtue, dynamis, is so closely related to virtue and goodness. Literally, there was a power, but it was a power to accomplish a good work that went out of Jesus. We see the same example in Luke chapter 6, verse 19. We look at it first in the New King James, and it says, The whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out of him, and he healed them all. This is a separate story. This is two chapters before the woman with the issue of blood. Again, he's in a crowd of people, and they're all trying to touch him, because when they touch him, power goes out of him, and they're healed. Yet if we look at this same verse, just as we did in the last, in the King James, we find once again that virtue went out of him and healed all of them. It literally appears to be saying that goodness flowed out of God and produced healing to those who touched him. But there's, this is that aha moment of Sunday morning. You see, there was something very common in each of those stories in its faith. You see, there is a dunamis power that flows out of God. There is a virtue that flows out of God. There is a goodness that continually emanates from His character. And when it is touched by faith, we interpret it as goodness. But when it is disconnected from faith, it produces fear God has not changed the power that is issuing forth from him has not changed we're going to stay here a moment because you're still digesting this I can tell but this is critical it is the same power that is flowing out of God it is the same dunamis it is the same virtue it is the same goodness it is inherently who he is but depending on the perspective of where we stand determines whether we perceive it as goodness or if it produces fear. You see, if we are standing in faith and we connect our faith to that goodness, to that power, to that virtue, we perceive it as the goodness of God. It literally produces good works. Remember the definition of goodness. It is a goodness that desires to serve others. Mark 10, 18 says that there is a goodness, there is not one that is good but God. You see, the world would define goodness as doing something for others. But I assure you that any goodness that is done in this world outside of God at some level serves the flesh. People do good things because they want to feel good about who they are. They want to feel good about themselves. There are people in this world that seek to do good things, but they do it of their strength, of their wisdom. And at some point, that is always rooted in self. Any act of service, any act of goodness, of giving in the world comes at some measure out of the flesh, out of self, out of feeling good about what's been done or feeling good about oneself, the only place that that selfless service comes from is from God. God's goodness is a goodness that flows forth that is independent of self. God demonstrates this in the cross of Jesus Christ. He utterly and fully surrendered himself. God fully gave his life. And so when we stand in a place where by faith we connect it to dunamis power, we connect it to virtue, we connect it to His goodness, we see the goodness of God moving. We see people healed. 
woman with 12 years that no, there was no solution for what she had. But when she connected her faith to the goodness power of God exiting his body, it produced goodness in her immediately. There was no question in that woman's mind that God was good. He had done for her selflessly what no other could do. The multitude came to him, seeking him, because there was a goodness in him they could find nowhere else in the world. There was no solution, no cure, no answer to their problems, their hurts, their ailment. Nowhere could it be found except in God. And when by faith they touched that virtue, that goodness, it flowed out. Now, we have people who stand in a completely different place and they look at the power of God moving in the earth, but they don't do it from a standpoint of faith, and it produces fear. Not a reverential awe of God, but fear. They tremble at God. They run from God. It's the same God. He's the same God. He's good yesterday, today, and forever. God hasn't changed. God hasn't moved. God's goodness hasn't deviated. But depending on the perspective that we are standing at, looking from unbelief, we see a God who is to be feared, a God who is dangerous, a God who has power that is scary or not good. And when we stand in a place of faith, we see the same God and the same power, but we realize that it issues forth to accomplish His good purposes in the earth, to accomplish goodness. When we understand by faith that He is inherently good, that goodness is a fundamental, foundational characteristic of who He is, so much so that His name, one of His names, could even be goodness. How are we seeing God? Through what lens are we standing in a foundation of faith? Because in that place, we will continue to see the goodness of God issue forth. The scripture goes on to tell us that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, we're going to read 8 through 11. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, this little characteristic of goodness this little Greek word that was invented for our Greek New Testament that only shows up four times, that is only attributed to God, is never a characteristic of man outside of God, cannot be produced in this world, in man or in the world outside of God, only comes from God and is only manifested in us when God is resident, is actually a tremendous stumbling block. It's curious. There's a lot of words here in the fruit of the Spirit that are translated different ways through the text, and they're intermixed and dispersed, and the more modern you get, the more we deviate and gravitate away from, from the original language. Even in the modern translations, this word goodness is consistently translated goodness. They just, they don't have another word for it, even in English. It is one of the few words that across translations remains as goodness. It is so foundational, so unique, and so solely attributed to God. But here's the funny thing. I believe it's one of the words, it's one of the characteristics, it's one of the things that Satan most seeks to steal. It's one of the things that he most seeks to counterfeit. Why? Have you ever tried to share your faith with someone and they said, oh, don't worry about it, I'm a good person. I do good things. It's one of the largest stumbling blocks Satan's counterfeit of this goodness is one of the largest stumbling blocks that people have to seeing the goodness of God because they see goodness in themselves. The Satan has spun a lie that if you are good, well, you're good. 
Satan has spun a lie that somehow that goodness can be produced in ourselves and in and of our works and in and of this world. And people say, well, I'm, I'm good. I do good things. There, I have goodness. So I don't need God. But God has something that can be found nowhere else. Romans chapter 15, verse 14, Paul writes to the Romans and he says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Paul says that I am confident that you are full of goodness. Paul knows they didn't get it from the world. They got it from receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. They got it from the indwelling spirit, the presence and the power and the life of God. The world would lead us to believe that if we are simply good, if we simply do good things, that that's good enough. The truth of the matter is outside of God, outside of the true and living God, outside of an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God has come to literally live us. There cannot be a production. There cannot be a manifestation. There cannot be an expression of goodness that actually measures up to goodness. It'll always be rooted in self. It'll always be rooted in the flesh. It'll be serving self. It'll be serving flesh. And it will be insufficient to meet God's standards. Only the life of God measures up to God's standards. Only the goodness of God produced in us by the Spirit of God dwelling through us. A life that is surrendered, submitted, and obeying God. That the characteristics, the very life of God is produced in us and through us. And that is the only place that true goodness comes from. This is not a goodness that we can manufacture. Not through religion, not through church attendance, not through tithes and offerings, not through community projects, not through Bible study, not through meetings. It is only obtained through an intimate and personal relationship with a true and living God who has chosen to leave his throne and come dwell within us. He has literally chosen to live his life in us and through us if we will allow him to. He will only do so if we invite him to. 